Hey guys, let's talk about some motherfucking science. Hello guys, welcome to another round of Journal Club. We're gonna talk about three articles today that I have read, found interesting, found helpful, found important and practical in the last two months because we didn't get to do one in October, sorry. Today we're gonna to start off with a classic diving right in from FMARC, that's the FIFA Medical Center. And the title of this article gives everything away basically. So high prevalence of medication use in professional football tournaments, including the World Cups between 2002 and 2014, a narrative review with focus on NSAID. So NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. That's like, for example, ibuprofen or naproxen or aspirin at a level you would use for pain relief, Tylenol or acetophenamine are not. Why I picked this specific article is there are other articles reporting on prevalence in the men's game overall, but this reports on FIFA tournaments in the men's game, the women's game, and the U17 and U20. So this is really important and interesting for my work working with males, females, and then youth uh, male players. 68% of adult male players reported using medication of some kind, more than half were using NSAIDs regularly. Now, as far as overall general medication use, there's a higher reported use of medication in general in the women's game, which makes sense because oral contraceptives obviously come into play as well as a couple of other things, but their NSAID use or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug use were about the same as men. Chronic question that I asked the entire time was, and they pointed this out as well as in limitations, is is this just extremely underreported? They asked team doctors inside of a 72 hour zone of a match, who took medication and what kind of medication? For this study, they didn't give any player information or IDs, but they gave the overall, what kind of medications do you take? Again, this is still most likely underreported because it's possible that it didn't come through the team doctor, that players self-medicate, uh, that it potentially wasn't reported for for other reasons and self-report is always a little bit sketchy. We're never really sure because there's has to be an error margin there and because we're humans and humans make mistakes and don't always report everything perfectly. But the fact that this could potentially be underreported as the statistics go, which I'm about to tell you is kind of crazy. Since 98, team physicians have to report medications taken by players around games that they know of, obviously. So within 72 hours, this is data from 10 men's, women's, and male junior World Cups, 20 and U17. As far as player medication use, about 0.77 substances in the men's game were consumed per match per player. So that's not quite one type of medication per player per match, uh, but the most common 36% in total were non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. 55% said they had used NSAIDs at least once during the tournament. Women, on the other hand, had 0.85 substances in their system per player per match, so that's closer on the at least one drug per person line, not quite. 15% re reported oral contraceptive use. Again, most common was also NSAIDs. Now going into the junior cups, U17 and U20 World Cups, there was 0.5 substances per player. So every second player was then on medication, which is significantly less than the 0.85 women and the 0.77 men. So that speaks to medication use rising then as you get into the adult game. There were no specifications about why that might happen. We can definitely get into uh, interpreting that ourselves, <laughs> why that might be. Another interesting point that they put in here was that 10% of male and female players, not juniors, reported using multiple NSAIDs. Speaks to either having significant pain or having a interesting team doctor. And interestingly enough, there was a very limited correlation between actually taking the drugs and actual reported injury. So injuries have to be reported to FIFA. And there were significantly more drugs taken and not by the same people who reported injuries. There's a significant non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug usage overall in sports and overall medication intake and said use as we said, goes up as soon as you become an adult, apparently because the juniors weren't taking that many, but in the men's and women's game, Yes, and this exceeds the actual number of reported injuries. So that means that people who aren't even injured are still taking drugs. Players that, regardless of whether or not they played a minute of the game, even if they were on the bench for the entire time, there were still players who took drugs, which is ground for a lot of questions. It could be, for example, for women that the person had cramps that day, but why would they take it for every match over the span of three weeks? That's a different question. So what exactly is the context that very high percentage <laughs> of people are taking drugs that don't necessarily need to be in use. Is it just kind of part of the game? Because we're at risk of it now becoming part of the game and becoming normalized. Whereas NSAID use doesn't need to become normalized. It is not something that we need every day, multiple times a day, or should really get used to. And they also found that the team doctor was a pretty significant influence, which isn't really shocking because the doctor <laughs> has a, 
a medical background, obviously, and players likely don't know what they should and should not be taking, what in combination. So they did find that team doctors, especially in teams that had been taking a strange mix of medication or multiple NSAIDs at one time, uh, that the team doctor actually had an influence there. Let's also keep in mind that NSAIDs are harmful in the short and long term. So not just, oh, your liver, your liver, your liver. Let's not just think about that. Let's think about the delays in healing that it causes, especially in bone healing, in muscular healing, in protein synthesis, it slows it all down. It changes how we, in the short term, feel about what our body can do. Changing our relationship with swelling, changing our relationship with pain, sometimes numbing out pain when pain is there, alarming us, hey, you shouldn't play right now and putting us in risky situations because then we can hold it out because we're taking pain medication, etc. Yes, all of this is part of the game. The question is, is it really worth the short and long-term risks of not being able to regenerate completely? You know, the rehab takes longer and having also long-term issues with repeated NSAID use over a span of years of time, especially taking multiples. This is something that we really need to keep an eye on because it's obviously important that players' bodies can heal themselves, that they're given time for regeneration, that they're given the opportunity to regenerate and not just forced to take pain relief medication to get some relief in order to even be able to play and that they're not just popping pills even if they're going to be on the bench. That's definitely something that we need to keep an eye on. Sports scientists um, and sport medicine doctors, team doctors, keep a look at this over the years. The second article we're gonna do is a debated topic on the menstrual cycle in women's sports. This article is called The Effects of Menstrual Cycle Phase on Elite Athlete Performance, a Critical and Systematic Review. Again, if you're curious and wanna read through these articles yourselves, you're gonna find the DOIs, all the links, all the citations down in the description box, I think it's called. Uh, and also this would be a great time to subscribe and like this video if this is helping you out. Okay, so let's talk about menstruating. Really important topic. We're going to dive right in here. A couple of things as we go out, it's important to realize that at this point in 2022, women make up about 35% of participants overall in studies in sports science. In 2005, that looked a lot different. It was closer to like two to 5% because there has been basically a women blackout of female participants up until the early 2000s. It was just too difficult to study because women have different hormones. We have a cycle that also needs to be tracked and it was just always easier and more practical to work with the guys and do studies on guys. So now we've got a lot of making up to do. However, when women were tested in this 35%, they're often not high performance athletes or elites, especially when talking about the menstrual cycle. Data that has been taken is usually in very small groups. So small sample sizes, very specific to the context that it's happening in. They're usually also very short, so like four to eight weeks, which is one and a half to two menstrual cycles if you're lucky. And what's come out of this data are pretty severe misunderstandings about what actually happens in the body and during performance, during different phases of the cycles, especially like how individual hormones, but also hormone combinations influence health, performance, our perception of pain, etc. Because as this article points out, Olympic performances, gold medals have been won through every single phase of the menstrual cycle. We're regardless of. World Cups, World Championships, World Records have all been made, set, broken in all different phases of the menstrual cycle. This is so interesting to me because five years ago, nobody cared about people who were menstruating and how the menstrual cycle influences anything. And now suddenly people do care and it's like, oh, individualized training. We can only train this way during the certain phases because everybody is the same. What this article, and again, it's a systematic review, so it's reviewing all the literature on this topic within the inclusion and exclusion criteria, of course, of this article. But they specifically say from all of the research that they could find and collect, there is no one size fits all approach or mentality that it's going to work, especially in elite sports, because elite athletes, they need the individualization. Something general is not going to help them. On the other hand, and that's the opposite, general population people are often going to benefit from something general. So like we might need to do a little bit more endurance training in this phase, whereas in this phase, we might need to do a little bit more strength training. And those are general suggestions that the general population might be able to benefit from because they're not highly trained, they're not highly sensitive to inputs. However, when we're really, really approaching this topic with an athlete and really trying to get the best performance out, it has to be individual because that athlete's reaction to those hormones are going is going to be completely different than their neighbor, than their teammate, than their coach, than somebody else on somebody else's national team. It needs to be individualized. So we can't really make any huge umbrella discussions for anybody. A couple of points here that I um, wrote down in 
the results, the discussion, and the conclusion. I really enjoy this article. It's worth reading. There is a critical lack of research around the menstrual cycle. <laughs> um, between the phases and performance and elite athletes, there were seven studies in total as of 2021, and many had pretty severe methodological issues, which is not shocking because, again, as we said, small sample size. We're also often looking cross-sectionally. So looking at one point of time in one specific population and then trying to generalize that to everybody. There's also a pretty big issue with objective versus subjective measurements. Uh, a lot of these questionnaires or a lot of these studies use questionnaires, which is then required for self-report. When was your last period? How bad were your symptoms? What was your perception of pain or bloating or whatever? Then use external load measurements to quantify performance, whereas the self-reports then quantify where you are in your cycle, whatever. But one, no generalizability, as we said, all of these studies were created for that specific situation and are way too controlled. So they're not generalizable to all sports, to all people, to all scenarios, to all levels of play. And we also ha always have to reckon with there being an error in self-report because when we're talking about hormones in physiology, we need to be able to test the hormones. Like where are you in your cycle? What is actually happening in your body? What are the hormone levels? And what's the compare and contrast with performance and also perception? So a lot of these studies didn't even have a hormone measurement, which unfortunately is a little bit intrusive to athletes because it's blood sampling at this moment. We need to develop less invasive testing for hormones, but we really can't track the hormone cycle without actually tracking the hormones. It's just the accuracy is failing. So that's a serious methodological issue that we need to improve before we can really say much. The conclusion of all of these studies is that it's really still unclear which phase is more optimal for different types of performance because some women have physical and cognitive energy and efficiency during the luteal phase more than the follicular phase, whereas others have it in the opposite direction or during ovulation, while others are not at all influenced. There's no regular difference over multiple months in the different phases of, yeah, in the luteal phase, I'm cognitive cognitively not completely there. In the follicular phase, I'm physically not completely there. It was not constant for all women over all phases over a period of time. Now, a few studies um, like Ross Julian's work in 2017 and 2020, I believe, he reported a couple of different outcomes, one of them being that female soccer players had reduced maximal endurance during the luteal phase, but there was no impact on jumper sprint performance. Their match metrics weren't at all influenced. So you would think if your maximum endurance was less because you're in a certain phase of your period that match play would probably also be influenced, but it wasn't. And there's also other studies that have been done since then and before that that didn't see any influence actually on maximal endurance during the luteal phase. It's all up for grabs here, folks. Something else is there's a very clear focus slash interest in doing these studies on the menstrual cycle, specifically on injury. Sometimes we're too motivated and focused on how do I prevent injury? that we dive right in and say, oh, menstrual cycle is a big factor and then accidentally wind up studying the menstrual cycle, but it's not actually an adequate study for the menstrual cycle because it's more like we're saying, oh, this hormone and this hormone in this situation could cause tendon laxity. So you'll probably get ACL problems if your hormones fluctuate in this phase and you might then have a higher risk for ACL tears, for example. Or we'll say uh, decreased stiffness during the luteal phase is a potential for injury. We don't wanna have that because stiffness, it would make sense to have stiffness and that improves our performance, especially sprint performance, jump performance. So the focus on injuries around the menstrual cycle has been a driving force and that research is not adequate to actually tell us where in the menstrual cycle we're getting more injuries across all women, across all sports, what our actual injury risk is and where. And those studies aren't necessarily adequate to tell us more about the menstrual cycle or the phases themselves. Now, PMS, they said again, and I am all for this one, this one I completely understand and support, is that PMS, there are huge associations during PMS. So that's directly at the end of the luteal phase, beginning of the follicular phase, like this crossover right before uh, we start the bleeding phase in the beginning of the follicular phase. There are associations with performance decrements because of pain, because of blood because of not being able to sleep, because sleep is definitely uh, impacted, decreases in physical capacity in women's soccer. And a big part is that we know there's fluid retention. <laughs> a lot of cases, um, there's swelling, there's mood changes and fluctuations, there's pain. For a lot of people who menstruate, sleep right before the cycle starts is not so great. And so we could either go about that by reducing the load or increasing the regeneration or trying to get more sleep or focusing on sleep and recovery in that phase. And that might then negate some of the PMS symptoms that we perceive to be so bad. So we can never ever take away that PMS definitely has an impact, but that's because it's conscious, which tells us that there's a psychological and physiological component to this as well. Of course, there always is. Again, this article concluded that there's too little research to consistently support 
much. The fact that their general conclusion or summary was that we really need more longitudinal and perspective studies to say more about this. We need significant sample sizes across sports, across performance levels, and we need to focus on performance, like physical and mental, where we actually have performance statistics that we're able to work with, as well as actual health outcomes that we're able to see. And that includes as well having a better way to test that's not so intrusive, the hormones, like if we could do saliva, if we could do skin, anything else besides having to draw blood or do something that's more intrusive to the athletes. We also want to study the specific phases, not just the overall menstrual cycle, and we need to do this over a long period of time. So again, more people in the studies, longer studies, better tracking. Last and not least, let's dive into some statistics. This is an excellent and well-needed article in sports science by almost Dr. Daniel Kadlich uh, out of Australia slash Germany, as well as Sophia Nymphius, and it is called, With Great Power Comes Great Responsibility. That's right. Common Errors in Meta-Analysis and Meta-Regressions in Strength and Conditioning Research. Actually obsessed with this article because coming out of a sports science, yes, but also a psychology background, it's alarming the different level of statistical and methodological knowledge I got in my psychology degrees versus in my sports science study program where we got next to nothing. You pray to God you can read through an article and understand what it means. Whereas in psychology, we had stats one and two. We had, <laughs> had research methods one and two. We had methodological considerations. We had scientific writing, and that was in my bachelor. This is not something that sports scientists or strength and conditioning coaches get. It's not part of the general exercise physiology program. So this is greatly needed that we don't just read through articles and take everything as, yeah, this is wisdom here because we're not able to identify errors. So what is a meta-analysis or a meta-regression? So that's combining data from single studies. So you have exclusion and inclusion criteria. In this case, they took the 20 most popular meta-analyses studies or papers in strength and conditioning slash sports science and analyzed those. And then they combine all of that data to test then a hypothesis. So of those 20 papers, again, most cited, read, respected in the strength and conditioning slash sports science community, they found that 85% of those paper had serious statistical errors. And then they outlined five primary failures that lead to exaggerated results. I'm going to summarize them the way that I understood them and the key takeaways from the paper. Always be critical of your graphics. Graphics and statistics, the way that they are blown up and shown to us sometimes are not accurate. Sometimes they are blown up in a specific way, like zero to 10 is the first line and then 10 to 12 is the next line. So that 10 to 12 looks just as big as the zero to 10. And then the 10 to 14 is just as big as the 10 to 12. I'll show you an example here. This is from the Whoop device that I laugh at literally every single day. It bothers me so much as somebody who understands statistics. So be critical of graphics always, read them through, make sure you actually understand what is being said and what the data is trying to communicate to you through this graphic. And by the way, in the news, this is something that is used all the time to show an exaggerated effect when it's actually not that big. Second, big effect sizes are worth questioning, okay? If you got something 0 0.8 is a big effect size. They had effect sizes upwards of three. Start questioning your effect sizes. Be suspicious of anything extreme like that, any extreme numbers, especially extreme outliers. Ask if the data point is even possible. This article gave one example of a study that had found that there was one extreme outlier and in an eight week intervention study for strength training, something like 110 kilos on the bench press or back squat, something like that, which is not even biologically possible in six to eight weeks. It is not possible. And so be critical of outlier points. So go back and double check your work. Obviously this is for the researchers and not for the people who are reading, but if you see an extreme outlier, also just be critical of that. An effect size is um, the meaningfulness of a relationship between variables or groups. So like how significant something is. Yes, we have p-values, but we also have ES. So again, when we're looking at this, how is this even possible to have this big of an effect in this period of time or with this inter- They also found that authors confuse the standard error and the standard deviation, which is also kind of funny because they're similar, but it's still the wrong number and you're gonna get a wrong result if you use the wrong one. They're both measures of variability, but the standard deviation is variability in a sample. It's like the spread of, a, of data from a mean, so just with one sample, whereas a standard error is variability across different samples of one population. It's like multiple measurements. So if we have like a rat population, the one study with three rats is going to be the standard deviation of weight from the mean. And then if we do multiple studies with multiple different kinds of rats, then that's going to be the standard error because it's literally the SD of multiple sets of means. But we don't wanna get those th two things confused, even though at the end of the day, they're both standard deviations or types of standard deviations and types of variability. We do not wanna get them confused because it's gonna lead to a 
falsified result, essentially. The fourth is, can the data or conclusions actually be generalized? Or is the study just so specific, the intervention and the sample so specific that they're actually not generalizable results? But yet in the conclusion, they say, it's true that a five by five back squat three times a week is beneficial for every population, whereas it's not beneficial for kids, it's not beneficial for older people. If they can't get into a back squat, it's not beneficial for people who have knee or back issues. If they can't get into a back squat, kind of a bad example, but you kind of got to make sure that it's actually generalizable, that it actually applies to all of the populations. That would mean that general population plus elite athletes, plus amateur athletes, plus every level of performance, plus people with illness, all of an actual general population was included in the study to actually actually be able to say it's generalizable to all of these populations or did it, it only get tested with elite athletes, but now it's suddenly generalizable to the whole world. The last one I found the most interesting because I've had this problem as well in my own research as a grad student when I was at the university, I also found this interesting and continue to find it interesting in studies that I read myself. Are there just within groups differences? Or are there also between groups differences. And that is if I have a control group and then I have a group that does neuroathletic and the control group literally does nothing for eight weeks. And this group does neuroathletic for eight weeks. And then we do a test and retest and suddenly the control group data disappears because you have to have a control group in order to do an experiment correctly. And then we are only focused on this within group the pre-test and post-test before and after the eight weeks of neuroathletic training. And then they leave that control out and we're getting overly positive results from the within group Whereas if we looked at the between group, it could be the case, for example, if we don't re report between group at all, that's a bad idea. But the between group, for example, could be that this control group also had all of those differences and there's not a difference between groups after that eight weeks because the changing from winter to spring with the days start getting longer and then performance changes, regeneration and health changes as well. And then if we had left that control group out, those between group differences, we would just think, oh yeah, neuroathletic gave us all of these differences, whereas it was actually a latent variable. It was something else that we didn't control for. And both of the groups had significant changes at the end. So basically with or without this intervention, we still would have gotten the changes. That leads us to say this intervention is actually worthless if the control group who didn't get the intervention actually got the same changes in the post-test. That's really important because that leads to overly positive results and we want to be encouraging and we want to be positive, but not at the risk of falsifying data or exaggerating or turning it into a marketing ploy. Daniel and his team calls for more transparency, more open science with analysis and interpretation of data. I am all for it. How do we uh, procure data? What's our procedure for acquisition? What are the codes? What are the R scripts that we're using? Do a data check when you're doing a meta analysis or a meta regression. You can't just use a simple linear regression for everything. You have to double check the data. Just because a paper is well cited and well respected does not mean that it is perfectly accurate without error. It's just unfortunately not the case. And this is not to say that science is not somehow trustworthy, that it's not beneficial, that it's not transferable, that it's not valuable. That's not the case at all. It's just human error <laughs> happens, especially with numbers where things get complicated, especially if you're working with a huge data set or a very complex intervention over a long period of time, the data gets difficult, especially in a meta-analysis or a meta-regression where you've got multiple studies, the data out of multiple studies with probably massive groups of people, and you're trying to analyze that all at once. It happens. However, that's also why we have the peer review process so that other people, other editors from journals, other scientists, statisticians, those people read it over, look through it, really consider what's going on. Is this accurate? Does the data itself also need a little bit more work? Is this even an accurate calculation and then interpretation as well, because the peer review process currently is good, but to be a peer reviewer, which means you, you know, work for the journal, the editor sends the paper to two reviewers and then they review an article, write comments on it, send it back to the author and say, yes or no, we'll take it or not, or you need to revise, etc. Okay, they don't get paid to do that. So it often happens, especially in my experience, that they read it through really fast, miss all the methodical and data stuff, might make a couple comments about uh, how you wrote it or that they'd like to know more here or that they'd like you to define it better, something like that, but they don't really dive into the data or to the stats. So the methods sometimes get comments, but the results very rarely. It's usually a, more about how we display them, whether or not they like the table we used and not really whether or not the statistics were accurate. So again, not to say that this is not trustworthy and it's okay that if science has errors here and there, that doesn't make it untrustworthy or less valuable. It's more that this combination of errors in a lot of studies where we don't look at all can be really dangerous because suddenly we start getting again overly positive or overly negative about things that actually aren't that big of a deal or are actually inaccurate 
and sports science is such a new field as well that we don't have a ton of quality literature or statistics or data sets where we can be like, my data turned out like this. I'm gonna compare and contrast to these thousands of other studies on this exact same topic, or I'm gonna repl replicate the study again because I have the money and the funds and the time to do that. That's not how it works. A lot of times the studies that we're doing are the very first time somebody has ever studied something like this. <laughs> or when we're doing meta-analyses, it's with like five to 10 papers because there's not more than that. So it's sometimes hard to check and balance your own work, especially with the peer review process, which again, people aren't always super motivated to be a part of. That's something that we in sports science really need to get better at. There's other fields that are much further along, psychology, for example, psychiatry, medicine. They're much further along than we are, but sports science is still just a new field. We're still getting our feet under us. And that's also why it's important to be really specific with our data, to be purposeful with it, and to be as accurate as possible as well. So we can really lay that foundation of a good scientific, of literature, of statistics, of having a good background. And for people who actually just read studies and aren't actually doing the research, don't just read the discussion and the conclusions. Read the whole thing through. Yes, results might be difficult to understand, but you need to know the methods. You need to know what population it was studied on, how they carried out the research, if it's generalizable or not. The methods are extremely critical. So even if you're just gonna read the discussion and conclusion, add methods and add introduction, because you need the background. Why are we doing the study? Why does this matter? What influence could it have? What are, what's our hypothesis? What do we think it could do? What do other studies say it can do? And so we need the intro methods. If you skip results, okay, I understand that, but discussion and conclusion afterwards, as well as the limitations. Read the limitations. No study is perfect. No scientist is perfect. That's totally okay. Again, one error is not going to uh, change the course of sports science history at all. It's more this combination of errors repeated over and over and over again without getting called out. Suddenly we have famous papers that actually are riddled with errors and aren't actually as positive and bona fide as we thought they were. So keep your eyes out. And vielen Dank, Daniel, für deine Forschung, für deine Anregungen, für deine Ideen. Super, super cool. Hat mich mega gefreut, das durchzulesen und zu sehen.